And uh, it's such a crucial matter as all of us who practice in Shrivachan and Buddhism know only too well. But you may wonder why uh, I chose to take for the first two sessions politics and then education and then suddenly go back deep down into our own lives. But there was a purpose behind that. Um, the first sections of the, of the dialogue between Dr. Toynbee and President Decatur uh, actually deal with this matter of the inner self and also, uh, next, what you could call the outer self, which is our environment. So uh, this is the way they begin. And one must remember that really, if you study the shape of that dialogue, the way in which it's set out, the way in which Sensei approached this whole matter with this great old scholar, uh, you'll see in the end, you'll really understand that it was Shakabuku from beginning to end. So Sensei begins with the inner self and then the environment to establish clearly the two fundamental Buddhist principles, most fundamental, or three really. One was the dignity of life and our connection within ourselves, the indivisible connection between our spirit and our physical self. And then from there, the absolute inseparability between our inner self and everything that's around us, our environment, or as I said, you could call it the outer self. The connection is so complete, though it takes us time and practice to understand that. So really, by taking those two great principles, plus the dignity of life first, Sensei is setting the scene for Dr. Toynbee. And then the last sections of the book itself are the most incredible uh, uh, explanation of the whole of Nishin Vashonin's teachings. So he took Dr. Toynbee from the inner self through the outer self and all aspects of society and then finally brought it all together in terms of Nichiren Vashonin's Buddhism. And the last sections of this book, I believe, I'm speaking personally, I think they're the greatest uh, statement of the teachings of Nichiren Vashonin that exist anywhere in modern terms outside of the brochure. So this is why this book's so exciting. It is Shakabuku. He was really doing Shakabuku to Dr. Toynbee from beginning to end. And Dr. Toynbee was agreeing. Step by step, he agreed with everything. The one thing they couldn't agree on, I think I mentioned it in the first session we had, was uh, euthanasia, the right to do away with yourself if your life becomes too unpleasant and tortured uh, and, and, it's, and you're being tortured by your circumstances. Dr. Toynbee believed in that, but Sensei did not, of course, as a Buddhist. The extraordinary thing was that in the end, as I, I can't remember whether I told you this or not, but in the end, Dr. Toynbee had a stroke and he was totally paralyzed for a year. It's an extraordinary thing. This was the very matter, the one point which Sensei and Dr. Toynbee couldn't agree about. But when I rang his secretary the moment I heard about his death, uh, his secretary was an elderly lady who had been with him many, many, many years. And she said, you know, the wonderful thing, Mr. Corston, was that although he was paralyzed, his eyes were always incredible, so bright, so alert, and we really felt he was, even though he couldn't write anymore, he was still working. So one wonders, of course, whether in that last year of being paralyzed, his spirit, obviously, is still bright, he was, his mind was still working. And maybe, for all we know, he also resolved the matter of euthanasia. He certainly never any, asked anyone or indicated to anyone that he wanted to be put out of his uh, life into death. So it's interesting, isn't it? Anyway, that, that maybe gives you an idea why I feel this book is so great. So I chose 
to take the two subjects, politics and education, first. In a way, because I wanted to drop you all in the deep end. I wanted you to begin to see, right at the beginning, through studying those two sections, what the concept of Kos and Rufu really is. We tend to think of Kos and Rufu as some enormous, huge ideal, which is, in a way, beyond us. We know Kos and Rufu means a peaceful world, a prosperous world, a world in which every human being has the opportunity to use their full potential. But that's a very big ideal and not terribly down to the situation to earth concerning the situation we're in now. But the concept of Kos and Rufu, of course, that is the broad view of it. But the view of it in a down-to-earth form is that each single person who chants nam myoho Neko is creating change in their own particular, personal, individual environment. And through the wisdom of the Gohonzu working in them, through the compassion of the Gohonzu working in them, through the courage of the Buddha state working in them, just through the influence of what they say and what they do, they bring about change in their or our particular sphere of life. It could be as a doctor, it could be as a nurse, it could be as a mother, it could be uh, as anything you like to think of in terms of society. For each one of you have a different path that you're following. Not one of you is following exactly the same path as someone else. There may be two of you who are nurses, but even so your path is different, isn't it? That path of life that you're going down. So it's on that path, in those circumstances, without almost realizing it, because the Gahonzan and the wisdom of your Buddha state is at work, that you bring about change. You influence people. What you say has a different slant to it. You don't think about this, but it has. Because you're practicing this Buddhism. So you can bring about change gradually, each of you in your own <coughs> sphere of action. This is Kos and Rufu. The way, the concept of Kos and Rufu, or the way we achieve that ultimate ideal in the end of changing society, not just in this country, but throughout the world, isn't it? Now this is an incredibly exciting thing. So we talked about politics, how the influence of individuals who are practicing to the Gohans can bring about change in the way the people use the democratic system of this country, didn't it? Just the very fact that even as a housewife, or as a mother, let alone uh, someone in teaching or a doctor or whatever, even in that role, politics are of concern. We have to use, the human beings of this country have to use this democratic system and improve it and reform it so that it really does express the views the many and varied views of all the human beings of this land. So even in a small way, in a simple way, just by talking to other women uh, in your, where you work, or if you're going to have a baby in the clinic, you can bring people to think about this in a new way. Politics are all of our concern. We're not politicians, but they're the concern, aren't they, of every human being in this country. We have the good fortune to have a democratic system. We're not a dictatorship, living in a dictatorship. We're not living in a fascist country. We're not living uh, in a country where freedom is stifled. Therefore, all of us, all of you, can bring about this change gradually just through your attitude, just through your way of looking at things. 
So it's no good sitting and saying politics is not my business. Or I don't understand it. Politics is our business, every single one of them. Not in a, not in a professional way, as a professional politician, but because politics affect our lives and the happiness of the people of this country. It affects your children in the future and so on. And then we took education. Similarly, education affects everybody. We may not be educators, we may not be teachers, but education affects us. We can look back on our education and see all sorts of flaws in it. Or maybe we think it was a wonderful education, and it probably was. But that's not the end of it. The country is full of young people. Babies are being born every day. I don't know how many there are, I forget the statistics, but an awful lot. They're all got to be educated. We want a great future. Who creates the future? It isn't just politicians. Not at all. It has to be the ordinary human being. If it's left to an exclusive group, then it'll be a failure. Education has to be what the ordinary human beings really see as their need and the needs of their children and their grandchildren. So we can't say education has nothing to do with it or we don't understand it. In a sense, of course, too, every mother and every father is an educator. It begins there at home. So in that respect, too, education is crucially important. So this is why I took those two subjects in order to give you an understanding clearly of the concept of Kosu Nufu, of the way we can change society, each in our own individual field, through the power of the Gons of working in us. Now we can start to the inner self, where everything begins, okay? That's the reason why I do it that way. I hope it's understandable to you. So it's interesting that Sensei said when he was in France, just when he came this year. He wanted everyone to be like lighthouses. That was the expression he used. And really that's what I've been talking about, isn't it? On one's own chosen path in life, you stand like a lighthouse, lit up by the gohonzum that shines in your life, though you may not realize it, through your practice. The people are attracted to you. You can help overcome, with encouragement, their negativity. You are a light to them. They see it. So it's important that we realize this and respond, isn't it? People will seek you out more and more in the future because they feel something about your life, something that's quite intangible. But nevertheless, they do because the Gohonzon is shining in even without one realizing So as a lighthouse, we attract people, we attract their attention, and also, just like a lighthouse, we can encourage them and give them hope for the future. Make them understand they're not just a cog in a wheel. Not just a cog in a wheel because you are not a cog in a wheel. You're doing something to bring about change for the better in the future. This is our role. This is Kosen Rufu in action. You will follow. It's an incredible concept. And as I said several times, I know, it's happening all over the world. Everywhere in the world. This amazing movement is taking place. It's absolutely unprecedented. It's enormous. And yet it's very down to earth, isn't it? So behind it all is the power of democracy. We can't appreciate the power of democracy. It's very difficult to, for us to believe that if we're chanting for peace in Ireland, say, that it's going to have any effect. It's not easy, is it, to believe? But the fact is, if our itchinen is towards peace in Ireland, 
if we send daimoku, even only a few daimoku every day to that, it is having an effect. You maybe can't see it on the surface of life yet, but it is. It wasn't long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, since he said, he actually said, when there are at least 10,000 members in every single country of the world, we will have achieved Kosum Rufu. So, of course, if there are 10,000 members in every single country of the world, there are many more than that, of course, in those countries that are the most advanced in terms of Kosum Rufu. When there are at least 10,000 members, some, mem some countries by then may have millions. Others may have hundreds of thousands. But in his wisdom, that was what he said. Even he said, when uh, there are a thousand members in a country, the process of stabilization of that country begins to take place. But when you hear that, one realizes, you know, why it was such a struggle for us to get to a thousand members. Those last few hundred were really difficult. It was really a struggle. And there was a lot of Sanshashima around. So you can visualize also that when we get near to 10,000 members, we're going to have a great struggle again to break through that barrier. And of course to go beyond many countries in the world where there may be only one or two members maybe they're even practicing secretly for some reason politics or whatever there's a long way to go yet by that time we've got to have many 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 more than 10,000 men and in general terms what Sensei is actually talking about is the power of Daimoku the united power of Daimoku of 10,000 members is colossal. After all, when you think about it, you as an individual are certainly by now getting experiences that you can change your whole life and circumstances through chanting Nam Myoho Renge as an individual. Put a thousand, ten thousand individuals together, the power of that Daimoku is colossal. Huge. But sadly, we tend to restrict it, don't we, with our imaginations. We can't take it in. We're sort of timid about chanting for what is best. Because we feel it's impossible. That's why one of the great cries in NSUK, and I hope it always will be, is no second best. No second best. You've got the most powerful weapon in the world to use to gain the best. Hmm? It's true. Okay, so let's go on with the actual uh, to talk about this particular section. So, the first part really concerns human dignity. Human dignity, if you like, as against the animal instincts and actions that also exist in every human being. Because as Dr. Toynbee rightly points out, we are in fact, physically, animals. There's no difference in our functions to those of animals. The difference is, of course, that we have minds and the ability to think and make judgments which other animals do not have. So that puts us in a different position. In, I might say, a much more complex position, too. I'm not so sure life isn't a good deal easier when you're an animal, and you don't have to think. And everything is from instinct. But nevertheless, if what Buddhism is teaching us, is if we use our thinking minds as an instrument of the Buddha state which exists deep in our lives, then we can be something very, very different indeed to animals. 
uh, Toynbee points out that this causes innately a conflict in our lives. We have this thinking mind. We have deep in our lives uh, the Buddha state, though Toynbee doesn't say that. So, spiritually, we can feel what is good and great and valuable and what isn't. But at the same time, we have to cope with a physical body which is animal. And this brings about conflict within us. The sensei quite quickly moves on to explain those two principles I mentioned earlier the inseparability or indivisibility of body and mind or spirit and the inseparability of ourselves and our environment. The first principle in Japanese is called shiki shin funi shiki shin funi shiki <coughs> is body or physical aspect of life shin is the spiritual aspect of life. And funi means indivisibility. Or literally, two yet not to. Two yet not to. And esho funi, you all know, I'm sure, only too well. Again, the word funi, which is indivisibility, of esho. Esho, meaning yourself or ourselves and our environment body and shadow. So Buddhism teaches that when we move in some way, spiritually and or physically, the environment is like a shadow to ourselves. When, they, when we move, think something, create something, determine something, it affects exactly our environment. So, of course, what we're aiming for is, isn't it, to achieve the highest life state, the Buddha state, so that our environment, too, reflects that Buddha state, the shadow of ourselves. So, by and large, I think, to sum up what they both discuss and say, as human beings, we have uh, a few alternatives as to the way we choose to live. In respect of this problem of our animal selves and our spiritual selves, we can, as the first alternative, allow uh, our inner self to become like an animal too. That's one alternative, isn't it? And I dare say we've run across a few human beings in our time who seem to be following that path. And very tragic sight it is. Such degradation. Or another alternative is to struggle to try to completely deny our animal selves and separate completely that physical animal self in terms of our inner life with our spiritual self. This is the teaching of many religions, including uh, Christianity, that we have to separate the spirit from the flesh, as it's put. Buddhism says it's impossible because of that principle of Shikishin Funi, because of the actual, the constant interaction between our spirits and our bodies, what our inner life is doing and saying, or making us say, and what our physical inf influences, desires, pressures, and so on is doing. So it's a conflict. You can't separate them. If you're unhappy over a long, long period, you will make yourself unhealthy. If you're angry incessantly, that too will have its effect on your health. 
This is what Buddhism is saying. So many different ways, all aspects of our lives are interwoven with our physical self. One reacts upon the other. So that's the second alternative, isn't it? Third alternative, of course, is to recognize completely that we have these two aspects of our lives, spiritual and physical. So this is taught in Buddhism through the theory of Ku, K, and Chu. I can't go into it in detail today, that's a study matter. But probably you, you know that K is that physical aspect of your life. And Ku is the spiritual or unseen aspect of your life. And the most important thing is the understanding of Chu or Chudo. Hmm? Chudo, which is the middle way, actually. In other words, there is at the heart of your life the power to bring together your physical and spiritual self, Ku and K, so that they work in perfect harmony. Neither one nor the other in conflict with the other. So Chu, chu or Chudo is that binding force at the heart of one's life, which brings the two to work in perfect rhythm or harmony. So, of course, Chu, Chudo, is the heart of your life, nam myoho renge kyo The power of the Buddha state. So, in a sense, one of the one of the tragedies of human life up to now is that they have been ignorant of the existence of that power. Chu, Chudo, of the middle way. This is why, because of that ignorance, Christianity couldn't think of any other way of teaching except to say you've just got to struggle and try to separate your spirit from the desires of the flesh. But that's impossible because they're all, both are an integral part of one's life. The Buddhism shines the light to such depth, doesn't it? And points out that there at the heart of your life is the Buddha state. Uh, the, the entity of your life, the entity of your life and everyone else's life, which is nam myoho The life force or power to integrate the two aspects of spirituality and the physical self. So, of course, our great experiences that we have once we start to practice is due to that integration, isn't it? To that harmonizing between those two inner, the inner aspect of your life and the physical self. In a self, in a sense, the body or the physical self is part of one's environment when you view it from the inner self's point of view, isn't it? So just the same as through the power of that state, our environment around us, we learn, is like our shadow. It reacts exactly to the state within us. Of course, the body, too, is part of that environment in a sense. So this is the greatness of Buddhism, that it teaches that at the heart of us all is nam myoho that ability to harmonize. So uh, the authors, interestingly, but I'm sure wisely, challenge the most difficult aspect of the inner life first, <coughs> the inner life and the outer life, which is sex. So. Uh, they dive into the deep end themselves in that respect. I'm sure they chose sex because uh, all the instincts of animality, of the world of animality, can most easily come to the surface in a human being due to sexual desire. The most powerful desire or impulse probably that exists in us 
Therefore, sex is a problem to human beings. I'm sure every one of you would agree with that. It's a real problem. The problem between our animal instincts and our human selves. And of course, to make it even more of a problem, it is the creative power of life in terms of procreation. The human race continues to exist, or the human species continues to exist because of the sexual urge. So one can't say that you can get rid of it, or chuck it away, throw it out of the door, because it's crucial to life itself, isn't it? But there are no built-in checks, no built-in defenses, if you like, against the sexual impulse. Animals have it built in. They have periods when they're on heat and when they're not on heat. It's all done for them, isn't it? They can't think. They follow a rhythm of life which is natural, built into them. But the human being doesn't have the good fortune have periods when they're on heat and not. If we eat too much, there is a built-in defense. We get sick. Sorry to use the term, but we throw it all up. <laughs> hmm? If we sleep too much, which is another animal instinct, we find we're out of work, not making any money not getting anywhere. And in the end, that's a built-in defense against sleeping too much. If we use violence in any way, this would particularly apply to young men, perhaps more than young women, but if we use violence, uh, then there's always the possibility of us getting hurt or killed. There's a tendency for a person to say, well, I got away with it this time in his heart but uh, maybe next time I'm not going to. So there's a deterrent there. But unfortunately with sex, there's no deterrent. I suppose, though, it's a personal thought, this one, but it's interesting thought. And please don't quote me. <laughs> but Buddhism teaches that we create our own deterrents. Everyone has goodness in them. No one really wants to live like an animal. So we can create our own deterrents. If we find sex is a terrific problem, then somehow in our minds we'll create some sort of a deterrent. I mean, I even wondered when I was, only last night, just thinking about this, you know, is it, we, what is the cause of AIDS? Why has AIDS appeared? Is it us creating our own deterrent? Because there's no doubt that the uh, unbridled sexual influence, if it really takes hold of a person, is a tremendous problem if they really give in to that animal instinct, and it takes complete control of their life, they suffer so desperately because of the conflict going on with the goodness in their spirit. They don't want to go on hurting and harming people, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, that's just the thought. But I do believe we create our own deterrents. And sometimes those deterrents can be physical. Now, even these days, you see, the deterrent of having babies has gone. Fifty, sixty, a hundred years ago, starting with, probably with the Victorian era, for a man or a woman to have an illegitimate baby, you know, was a socially disgraceful thing. This led to all sorts of problems, by the way. I'm not saying that was good. But it was a deterrent. Yeah, abortion became illegal. 
And even the thought of having to go to some sort of witch doctor, some ghastly old woman, you know, right, to do right. terrible things to you was a deterrent in itself. That's gone, too. The scientists invented the pill. All the deterrents disappear. So, in some people, you know, the animal instinct has run wild, out of control. In other ways, too, you can find everyone worrying about overpopulation of the world. Yet probably the same person who is concerned about that may produce a baby which is unwanted. Through, through in a way, thoughtlessness and the power of the animal instinct. And we see everywhere the media, pornography, all encouraging sex for self-satisfaction. Usually at the expense of another in the case of pornography. It's a strange situation. Even in my lifetime, things have changed so incredibly. We've gone from one extreme to another, from intense, hypocritical Puritanism of the Victorian age, which my parents lived in, to completely the opposite direction where everything runs wild. And there's no rock or basis on which people can base their lives. Nothing that they can get a grip on to help them to keep steady and challenge what they know is running away with them. But really, you see amazing things. You can walk through a park and see a couple at it under the bushes. <laughs> but what else is that but total animality, isn't it? Unbelievable animality. But you'll see it in any park. If you go through <laughs> if you walk through at the right time. <laughs> so since then Toynbee discussed this and uh, Toynbee says that the important thing is love, naturally, he would say that. That the animal instinct which is there, whether we like it or not is totally transformed if it's combined with love. In other words, with, with absolute concern for the other person involved. And of course, Sensei agrees with that. We can't repress the sexual instinct. That's what Christianity had a go at doing, and probably other religions as well. It doesn't work. If the sexual instinct is repressed like a spring being pushed down, in the end it's going to explode. So Buddhism, rather, says we can transform it. It is there, whether we like it or not, the sexual impulse exists in us, so we should use it for good and value and beauty. So, we use sex in terms of Nichiren Vashon and Buddhism for that. If, I suppose you could say uh, it's using sex with wisdom and compassion. If we two people can gain happiness value out of the sexual act, then it is good, and both will feel great if that concern for the other has taken place first. Am I wise to have sex with this person? Is it going to cause them hurt? Is there a danger of us regretting it deeply in the future. 
It is having sex with wisdom, isn't it? Pausing for a moment before committing oneself. So I really feel, you know, Buddhism is incredible because it gives one the ability to do that. Legend Dai Shonen said in the Gosha, didn't it? Even in the act of love, chant nam myoho renglicha. He didn't mean in the middle of the act of love <laughs> physically. Of course not. But what he meant was that the act of love should be founded on daimoku. In other words, before committing oneself in a relationship, you really chant daimoku and ensure that it is wise and that it's valuable and that you can gain great happiness and value from it. That, that is what Nishan Daishonin's Buddhism is teaching. In that way, you can transform. You are transforming, aren't you? The sexual impulse, which can be so destructive that you're transforming it into a force for good, a force for happiness. So this may seem difficult, but it isn't difficult, I believe. It seems strange to begin with when we first start to practice to base all our decisions on chanting. So the, what is being said here by Nichiren Daishonin, you know, don't leave sex out of it. Include that as well in one's chanting to make sure that we live a life based, of course, at times on sex, but sex with wisdom. Toynbee goes on to say that he believes this extreme state which society has got into and it's affecting the whole world really arose or the, the original cause of it was war, the two world wars. If men or women are being told that it's right to kill for a cause or whatever, that is such a fundamental ethical matter that it destroys ethics in all senses. Not just killing, but in every sense. So he points out the degradation of war, which came to a head in terms of the Vietnam War. Never has there been a war up to that time which showed such incredible human degradation. And many of you have seen films about it, maybe the films are exaggerated, but nevertheless it was a degrading experience in every respect for everyone involved in it. And this had its effect in everything. In, in uh, problems over alcohol, drug taking, rape, relationships, in every aspect of ethics was destroyed by that one command, if you like, even the church would say it was right to kill. It's incredible, but nevertheless it's true. So I can relate to that.